All right, so when we're talking about the anatomy of the pelvis, there's a couple of things we look at. One is the bladder. So the bladder is what holds your urine. It fills with urine and expands. And when you're ready to urinate, the bladder squeezes and urine flows through the prostate and out this urethra. So the prostate, because of its location in the pelvis, sits right at the neck of this bladder. It's about the size of a walnut. In some guys it can be bigger, it can be smaller. But in most guys it's about 40 grams or so and it's about the size of a walnut. And it sits here at the neck of the bladder. Now, it's just anterior to this rectum which sits lower and that's why when your doctor feels the prostate, he puts a finger in the prostate and feels the back side of the prostate. He's not able to feel the whole prostate, but he's able to feel the back side, not this anterior part, but the back side to feel for nodules or lumps or bumps and things like that. But the rectum sits right here. So this is the rectum. This is the pubic bone. So the pubic bone, if you push on your pubic bone down, you know, down this way, this is the pubic bone. You can feel the bone and, and halfway in between that pubic bone and the, the anus, if you draw a line there, about halfway through there is where the prostate sits. So it's deep within the pelvis. So this is the prostate here. That's the prostate. And the role of the prostate is the prostate creates or produces proteins that are helpful for the body during fertilization. That's what the prostate does. It also produces about a third of the ejaculate. The remaining two thirds of the ejaculate is produced by the seminal vesicles. And these are some sac-like structures that sit on the backside of the prostate that store seminal fluid. There's also a vas deferens tube that carries sperm to mix with the fluid. When you have prostate surgery, everything that's removed includes the prostate, this attached seminal vesicle on each side, and then each vas deferens tube is all removed as a unit. Sometimes, um, depending on your PSA and Gleason score and things like that, the surgeon may also remove some lymph nodes, but uh, sometimes that's done and sometimes it's not. So that's what your surgical specimen will have if you have surgery. It will include your prostate attached to seminal vesicles and this vas deferens tube on each side. Like I say, the rectum sits real close to this prostate here. This is where there's a thick fascia here called Denon Vies fascia that sits in this area deep in the pelvis. This is the external sphincter. And this is what helps keep you dry after surgery, that squeeze. And when, when you want to stop your flow of urinate, that muscle that you squeeze, that's the external sphincter. And so when you have prostate removal, this internal sphincter is you lose one of two sphincters. And so when this sphincter is removed, now what helps keep you dry or what keeps you dry is this external sphincter, which is why preoperatively doing Kegel exercises and things like that, strengthening this muscle can help you with postoperative incontinence or leakage. So that's the external sphincter. This is the urethra. This is the tube you urinate out of. Your nerves that control the erections and the additional bladder continents and things like that, these nerves run posterolateral to the prostate. So on the posterior side of each side, within a millimeter or two of each side, these nerve bundles, or they're called neurovascular bundles, run here. And these are the nerves that are very important, again, in helping you with post-operative erectile function and incontinence. So very important nerves that we'll talk about, you know, to preserve during surgery. Sometimes because the tumor may be out of the prostate, sometimes those nerves are involved with cancer and sometimes those nerves have to be removed, which again can affect a guy's post-operative erectile function after surgery or even after radiation or any type of, of procedure or any type of treatment you have for the prostate, regardless of what it is, there's a potential effect of any of this stuff 
you know, to affect the rectum, the nerves, the lymphatics, the blood vessels, you know, it, it can affect anything in this area. So there's no treatment that is without any, some kind of risk. There are some things that may treat the cancer with less side effect, but usually in those treatments, there's a decrease in the cancer the cancer control and that's what is so difficult to weigh out when you're trying to decide what type of treatment to have for prostate cancer. It's difficult to know. It's, it's difficult to weigh out the cancer control versus the side effect profile of each treatment. And that's why it's important to know each treatment, know the good, know the bad, you know, kind of be able to weigh it out. And then it's important for the patient to make that decision. Don't make your decision too quickly. There's usually no rush in making a decision with prostate cancer. There's usually plenty of time to research the options, talk to numerous doctors, get many opinions about different types of treatment and things like that. So don't be in a rush. Unless it's a, an aggressive cancer, if it's at least a 9, 10 cancer and you have a very high PSA, yeah, in those situations with an aggressive cancer, no, I wouldn't delay. I would talk to people quickly and I probably would. Well, you'd want to treat that much sooner rather than later. But for most cancers that are localized to the prostate, um, there was a recent study that came out that said, you know, six months is perfectly fine. And in those patients, waiting six months to find the right treatment option is something that did not change anyone's outcome. So don't be in a hurry to make a decision. Don't be in a hurry. Educate yourself. Talk to your doctors. Get numerous opinions on treatments for prostate cancer. When you make your decision, then that's the time to optimize your body and get ready for surgery. Get ready for radiation. Get ready for whatever treatment you're doing, even if it's active surveillance. A lot of guys, we talk about active surveillance. Some guys don't even treat their cancer because it is slow growing. It's not likely to change or spread. And in those patients, you can monitor them with a blood test, with MRI and with repeat biopsy and not have them undergo uh, major surgery or radiation treatments. You know, there's just a lot. Prostate cancer is a very difficult, complex topic. You can talk for hours and hours and hours and hours just about prostate cancer. It is that complex. Uh, I've been fortunate to have been a urological surgeon in my life, essentially dedicated my life to being a, a urological surgeon. Now I'm teaching guys about prostate cancer. So I hope you're enjoying what we're trying to educate you on. I hope it's helpful. I hope it explains, you know, gives you a better idea of how your body is made and what the purpose of the prostate is, you know, how your body can be affected after surgery, you know. After you heal from surgery, you know, as long as you can get erections, your orgasm, you should have an orgasm, but you won't see anything come out of the tip of the penis. That's because this prostate of the seminal vesicles, what produces the ejaculate has been removed. But the sensations should be the same. Some guys say it's different or it's assuming you can still have an erection, you're still able to have an orgasm. So that's it. I'm Dr. William Stiles talking to you on urologyanswers.com, uh, answering your urologic questions and in particular talking about prostate cancer, a very complex topic. A lot of the treat a lot of the books that guys read prior to surgery are five, six, seven hundred pages, big, big books. And I'm just trying to explain it. I'm just trying to explain it and make it a little more simpler so guys can understand it. That's it. I'm Dr. William Styles, urologyanswers.com. Thanks for watching.